Hello my dear friends and welcome back to another video. So no Mandalorian today, but we are going to be talking about the Andor show. To many fans, Andor was the best that Disney Plus has given us. Season 2 comes out next year, and even though it's only been a couple of months since the show finished airing, we have had a surprising number of updates. Whether it was the showrunner himself, Tony Gilroy, Diego Luna, Adria Hona, there have been a lot of interviews that have taken place, some which gave us insight into what we can expect in Season 2. So far, the biggest updates have been that we're returning to Yavin 4, but also that the first scene they filmed for season 2 here in the UK was of Cyril Khan. Now this piece of information is crucial because with Carl Solo returning, many fans wondered if Linus Mosk would also feature once again. He was portrayed by the brilliant Alex Ferns. While according to Ferns himself, the answer is a strong no, even though he wanted to return, and many Andor fans are feeling pretty disheartened. The character brought some levity and oftentimes accidental comedy in an otherwise very dark and serious show. Alex Ferns took to Twitter to respond to a fan who was hopeful of the character's return in season 2, but Ferns revealed, quote, you've seen the end of Mosk, and that he too believed he'd return in season 2, but unfortunately that's not the case. He went on to say, I thought that'd be the case, but alas, you've seen the end of Mosk. I had a blast playing him, and I'm glad you and others enjoyed him too. Au revoir. Now, I've got to agree with Bespin Bulletin, who reported on this when they say that the choice to not include him is outrageous and unfair. But that's the nature of season two. Tony Gilroy has a vision, the next four years of the story leading up to Rogue One, and in that story, things are very concise. So while he's keeping the core cast, he's simultaneously going to change things and make cuts. He wants it to be unique, and he also spoke in the past about new characters, new Imperials, and new Rebels. But we will still have Dedra, Cyril Khan, Andor, Mon Mothma, Bix, Luthan, you name it, all of those key characters remain. I've got to say, I thought Linus Mosk was a really fun character, and his portrayal by Ferns was spot on. Our final shot of him in season 1 was on Ferex, where he was drinking and drowning his sorrows on the streets. Many fans took this to mean a change in his personality. In that moment, he questioned, am I on the right side here? Am I doing the right thing? I think him just sitting down, getting out his flask, and having a swig is an evocative visual thing of art. No words needed to be said. You guys know just how much I love the Andor show. Bring on season two. Now, staying on the subject of Andor, but also tying in some other elements of the Star Wars universe, we're going to be talking about how the Bad Batch season two's latest episode is continuing a Lucasfilm trend, an obsession with ancient Star Wars history. I'm all for it, I love this kind of thing. Star Wars seems increasingly interested in the history of the galaxy, with notable easter eggs in the Bad Batch and the Andor show. Viewers have always been fascinated by the history of the galaxy. Even going back to 1977 with A New Hope, fans were introduced to many hints at the past. Obi-Wan's mention of the Old Republic, the Clone Wars, Jedi Knights, and so on, so Star Wars has always had an obsession with what came before. But both the Andor series and the Bad Batch go even further back. Back, they make references to thousands of years ago. In Andor, we had hints in Luthen's gallery, but the most interesting easter egg was the blue Kyber Kowati signet, given to Cassian as something of a down payment. Luthen reveals it had ties to the Rakatan invasion, an event from the old expanded universe that took place 25,000 years before the show. In the most recent episode of The Bad Batch, season 2 episode 5, Entombed, we have a very Indiana Jones-esque episode that was very reminiscent of a Doctor Afro comic. Fee Genoa, the new character voiced by Wanda Sykes, takes the Bad Batch on a mission for a pirate treasure hunt. She mentions the Skara Null, something all pirates know about, something that predates the Jedi Order. The crystal stone they look for, the heart of the mountain, controls the big metal beast they assumed was a cave. And there is mentions of the Ancients. Some fans have made the connection to the Zepho because the design of the beast is reminiscent of those we see in Jedi Fallen Order, ancient force users. I don't think there's a link. I also doubt they're going to do more with it, but the similarities are there, and Star Wars seems very obsessed with going backwards in time. Not as dramatic in terms of time jump, but very similar is the High Republic. Lucasfilm wants to explore older time periods. I think they should do the Old Republic. There is a lot of content there. In the current canon, the ancient history of the galaxy remains something of a mystery, even now. According to the Star Wars Force and Destiny sourcebook Nexus of Power, many of the old expanded universe tales, including Dawn of the Jedi and Jedi vs. Sith, are actually in-universe legends, and there's a grain of truth in every story, explaining why so many easter eggs and references are making their way into current Star Wars lore, but the imprecise nature of these references makes it difficult to know for sure what the galaxy was like before the Jedi. Now, some fans are 
speculated that the ancients mentioned in the Bad Batch could be linked to the planet of Batu from Galaxy's Edge because that planet is situated in the Outer Rim and contains mysterious structures linked to a civilization called the Ancients. But it's difficult to know if these are the same beings because the term itself is very vague but the same. If they are, then this is a hint the ancients knew how to travel through hyperspace because their influence extended from the Kaldar trinary system to Batu. We first hear about the ancients in Galaxy's Edge Black Spire. Bear in mind though guys, ancients as a concept might be subjective. To someone like Fiji Noah, her heritage as a pirate might have their own ancients that are very different, so I don't think it's one thing. And even if there's no connection between the blue kyber crystal we see in Andor and other projects with similar mentions and callbacks, I think Lucasfilm just like throwing these things in. Just like Pablo Hidalgo said, everything in Luthen's gallery had no rhyme or reason to it. So while it's fun and as Star Wars fans we love to speculate, sometimes it's just better to see it for what it is. Sometimes there's no deeper explanation, which can be very, very frustrating, but that's just kind of the way things are at the moment. If we go back to the example of Luthen's gallery, we would all love to know how he got the holocrons, but there is a chance we never find out if it doesn't have any relevance to the story. I'm gonna stay optimistic and hoping that's not the case, because I want more for Luthen's backstory. And so finally, my dear friends, returning to Andor Season 2, this article from Collider claims that the two-season order should become the model for more streaming shows. In other words, when it comes to Star Wars series on Disney+, Plus, it should always be quality over quantity. So two-season shows rather than more, as long as those two seasons have a lot of depth. Now, I think this is what's so great about Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni. They're not as limited as Tony Gilroy is because we know Rogue One takes place, but rather with the Mandoverse, they can really push the limit. There are nearly three decades between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. That is a long period of time to explore, and so they can really do a lot of different things. The Mandalorian Season 1 was a hit, same with Season 2, and The Book of Boba Fett performed well as well. And just look at the numbers for The Mandalorian Season 3 trailer. It's only been out for a week, and it's breaking all kinds of records, Star Wars fans are craving more Mando. We can't wait for the third season and the Ahsoka show and everything that comes after it. Star Wars fans are hooked. But you do have a very rare case where a Star Wars show is so well received and so consistent in quality. I'm setting aside the Book of Boba Fett when I say this, but just based on the first two seasons, it's just fantastic in terms of quality. I have seen a couple of fans argue that season two should have been the last season. I don't know about that. I think this story, these characters, all of it is still flourishing but according to this opinion piece, Andor's two-season model should be the norm. They say the following, Andor sets a new standard for storytelling in Star Wars, with its exceptional quality and production values. But the limited format of two seasons, five years, is a benefit. It was originally going to be five seasons, but now cut down to two, which could be a good thing. And I think the point they're making is that sometimes TV shows make the mistake of going well beyond their expiration dates, or far beyond what the original creators intended. But Tony Gilroy's vision is a two-season straightforward story, but I do hope we have more shows afterwards, more spin-offs of Rogue One, as some fans like to call it, the Rogue One universe. But what do you guys think? Should TV shows have a limit? And how many seasons of The Mandalorian do you think there's going to be? My theory is that after season four, the show's going to branch out to something else, a new type of Mandalorian show. Share your thoughts in the comments down below of everything we spoke about. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one. May the force be with you always.